Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Munis Faruqi. I'm the director um, of the Institute for South Asia Studies, this wonderful place that you happen to be sitting in. I also am a member of the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. Finally, tonight I'm wearing a very special cap as the person who is going to be introducing our uh, speakers today. And also, before doing so, begging you, pleading with you to please turn your phones and other ringing implements off. <laughs> okay, it gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce Professor Isha Ray and Sharda Prasad. Professor Ray joined the Berkeley faculty in 2002 in the Energy and Resources Group. She received her PhD and MA from Stanford University, Buhis, not just joking, uh, and her BA from Oxford University. At present, Professor Ray is the co-director of the Berkeley Water Center. And for those of you, and I'm sure it's just a very small bunch of you who don't know what the Berkeley Water Center does, it is primarily focused on water resources research and management issues. It comprises more than 70 faculty members and uh, takes an interdisciplinary approach to broad thematics, including water re reuse, environmental data management, and water resources management. <clears throat> Professor Ray's own research focuses on water and sanitation, water and gender, and technology and development. But more specifically, her projects have focused on access to water and sanitation for rural and urban poor, and the role of technology in improving livelihoods. Over the years, Professor Ray has been an exasperatingly prolific author, and I use that word quite deliberately, as well as a co-edited 2008 volume. Professor Ray has written 36 peer-reviewed articles since 1999. That's about two a year. That's not right. <laughs> it's putting us all in you know, terrible light over here. Um, that said, I have to say that you know, seeing Professor Ray's um, research productivity plus all the other things that she does, she really does prove the rule wrong that there are 24 hours in a day. Somehow you manage to squeeze the 25th hour in Isha. Uh, it's quite amazing. And in that extra time that you have over the course of a normal day, not only do you get your research work in, but you also advise parties in the nonprofit center. You give TED Talks with brilliant titles like Gender Equality, A View from the Loo. I love that. Um, you train graduate students. 13 have completed their PhDs under your supervision since 2006. You serve as an editor or reviewer on a whole bunch of journals, and on top of all, you teach graduate and undergraduate courses. One of Professor Ray's graduate students is Sharda Prasad, um, also sometimes referred to as Sharda Prasad Chitadurga Srinivas Murthy. <laughs> and I just heard a great story, if I may share it that Facebook did not believe that that was his name and demanded his passport you know, for proof before they allowed him to sign up for a Facebook uh, account. <laughs> I love that. Uh, truly, sir, uh, barring a few German names, uh, yours is one of the longest I've ever encountered, but it's great. Um, anyway, after getting his BE uh, from Kuvenpu University in Karnataka, India, um, in 2001, Mr. Prasad worked for some years with some of the biggest names in the tech world, Infosys, Safety Corporation, and Symphony Services, before becoming a project manager for India Water Portal, a water management project that extended over 19 villages in Karnataka, and a couple of thousand individuals were covered in this uh, particular project. We were extraordinarily fortunate that he came to Berkeley in 2010 and earned his MS in 2012, and is now on the cusp of finishing his PhD in December 2017, fingers crossed. Um, his dissertation is focused <laughs> on the opportunity, no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> You've not heard it from me. I'm just gonna cut his funding off now. <laughs> his dissertation is focused on the opportunity and barriers to the use of human waste in Indian agriculture. Specifically, his work focuses on the actual signs of phosphorus recovery from human waste, the policies and regulations that facilitate waste recovery and reusage, and cultural attitudes to waste reuse among farmers in particular. 
He has also undertaken research on social and justice issues arising out of caste-based discrimination in India. Today, Ishare and uh, Sharda Prasad will talk about where things stand at the two-year mark for the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, a campaign by the Indian government to, and I quote, keep the streets, roads, and infrastructure of the country's 4,041 statutory cities and towns, as well as rural areas, clean. They will do so by telling us a tale of two scavengers. This event is part of the Institute for South Asia Studies initiative called Urban Wash. And it's designed to showcase events and speakers, such as the ones tonight, who specifically address urban water and sanitation issues in the Indian subcontinent. Please join me in welcoming Professors Isha Ray and soon to be Dr. Asa. So thank you, Munis. We are going to try to do this talk together, since this is based on ethnography that Sharda personally conducted and we have together framed and written up. It's the kind of work that won't actually show up as part of his peer-reviewed papers. And so we decided that we should find a different way, a photo essay type of way, to share this knowledge with everybody. Otherwise, we will never see the light of day. So the way we want to do this is we want to actually focus on Swachh Bharat up here, not at the kind of two-year mark, like how is it doing? That's not what this is about. This is about the workers on whom the success of Swachh Bharat eventually will depend. So what are their lives like? What is their work like? And what is their lived experience? This is what we're going to focus on today. And we're going to tell the story in a narrative form, very much as Sharda recalls the event and both of us have written it up together very much as he recalls the event. So that's going to be the narrative structure. We're going to begin with Lucknow. And we're going to start with a story that says, when you start doing this work, it is hard to eat dal. So it's been two years since invoking the name of Mahatma Gandhi and declaring that India needed toilets and whatnot over temples, that the Swachh Bharat mission was launched. And its overarching goal, as Professor Moon has said, is to eliminate open defecation and build new latrines and increase their use and so on. So the urban guidelines very clearly call for connecting toilets to sewers or constructing on-site septic tanks and on-site treatment, in effect, doing away with annual scavenging. That's what this is about. So we know, of course, that these guidelines may not be enforced locally. And if they're not enforced locally, then, in fact, if a whole spate of new latrines get built, then we're a little bit puzzled about if the household level dry latrines in India continue to stay dry, or actually even increase in number, then what actually will happen to the dehumanizing conditions of work that the manual scavengers face? And will it, in fact, increase the demand for their labor rather than bringing it down? It all depends on the enforcement and the implementation. So it's very clear to us that the Ambitious Sanitation Initiative has to put a lot of effort and financing into the health of its sanitation guidelines and to enforcing its toilet design guidelines. But the allocations of Swachh Bharat Mission Urban leave very little money for these two. So we're not quite sure what is going to happen. So this photo essay is going to describe a small slice of life in the family of one group of manual scavengers from the Valmiki caste, that's the Dalit caste, in Uttar Pradesh. We're going to begin. Lucknow, December 2014, morning of day one. Bhanu takes us to the corner of a street where two small huts occupy the center of a large vacant plot. This is the place where she stores her stuff, Bhanu says. She's covering for her sister Indu today. A broom, a bucket, and a U-shaped <coughs> scooper and a karhai-like container are stacked on top of one another. They are covered in a thick layer of dust and ash. It's easier to empty the bucket with the ash layer <coughs> because the fecal content does not stick to it. Nobody steals these? Nobody even dares to touch them. Banu can't help laughing. The toilet is at the far corner of the plot, close to the street intersection. It's a bamboo facade covered by a thick red blanket. It stinks to high heaven. When Banu lifts the cloth and tucks it into the gap in the bamboo frame, 
It exposes a space of about three feet by three feet. The floor of the toilet is just uneven ground. Two sets of flat stones are piled on top of each other and placed apart to create a space to squat. That space is now <coughs> overflowing. The excreta is loose. It takes several attempts to gather it all. Bhanu takes the container to the gutter next to the plot. She pours the contents into it. The yellowish excreta dissolves into the blackness of the water flowing in the gutter. Now it's evening of day one. Please come in. Bhanu greets us that evening, sitting on the floor next to a stove and cooking dinner for her family. Sharda's with Sagar, an activist in the community. Bhanu's welcome is joined by her husband, who's watching television with his children. And the family appears to be immersed in a Hindi soap opera that Sharda doesn't recognize. The house is just a room, 15 feet by 10 feet. The split door entrance is painted blue and framed by wooden pillars. At one corner, there's a small kitchen. In the opposite corner, three mattresses are rolled and stacked. The house is lit by a single fluorescent light on the wall. If you're done with your homework, put the books away, Bhanu says, looking towards her sons. But they don't move. These children, they don't understand the value of education or books, you know. They think that education is free. Education is free only if we send our children to government schools. But our children, I save up every month to send both my children to private schools. How far is the school? He asks them. <coughs> About three kilometers. It's a Christian school. Better to send the children to a school a bit far away. If other children get to know our caste, our occupation, they bully our children. This is from Sagar. Even my landlord and neighbors don't know about my work. If they find out, they won't rent this house to us. We have to share toilets, fetch water from the same tap. Bhanu pours milk into the water boiling with tea powder. She pours the chai into three tiny steel glasses. I don't want any tea, her husband says, looking at the number of glasses. Evening of day two. Bhanu is the eldest of three siblings, Bhanumati, Indumati, and Shashank. All three are manual scavengers, and they inherited this work from their mother. We're in Indumati's house today. Indu and her husband, Girish, have come home from work. While they wash themselves off, Girish outside. It's not too cold yet. Indu inside. Please wait just a little bit. Shashank fetches a metal container, puts in a few pieces of wood, douses the pile with a little kerosene, and starts a fire. Within a few minutes, the small room begins to warm up. Girish and Indu, wearing a, seat, a set of clean clothes, join them. Their son brings them some food from the kitchen, roti and dal. Indu puts extra rotis on Girish's plate. You eat. I can make more for myself. Do you need more dal? Girish nods. As Indu pours dal onto his plate, he turns towards Sharda and he says, You know, when you start doing this work, it is hard to eat dal for a couple of months. Anything yellow makes you sick. Indu tells us how she got started as a cleaner. During my mother's generation, all the work was done by women. When daughters got married, mothers-in-law would ask for a row of houses or sometimes an entire neighborhood as gifts. Having many sons would allow the mother to accumulate more houses through the arrival of daughters-in-law. She would trade houses when she married her own daughter off. Indu says, Sometimes the households donate old clothes. They put aside some sweets for us during festivals. They even address us as their daughters, you know. I just don't understand. Shashank reminds his sister, It is not a pleasant work, but it provides a steady income. He sounds pretty matter of fact. Indu moves a little bit closer to the fire. Let's go downstairs and have some chai. I haven't had any since the morning. As they all stand up, Sharda asks her, So is it hard to find time to even drink tea? She says, No, not really. We just don't want to put anything into our mouth until we have washed ourselves. Cleaning the shit of these people is bad enough. I don't want to put that in my mouth. Evening of day three. Bhanumati's husband does not want her to do this work. But we have two children and we need money for them, he says. 
Sagar has been encouraging us to start a business with the money the government will lend us. But we have never run a business. We don't know how to manage money. I'm afraid that the business I start is going to fail and the band might come and take the only home I have away from me. My family will not forgive me, you know. How about a small business that does not need a lot of investment? Say, a corner shop or a tea stall. Ashata asks it. A tea stall is a great idea. People drink a lot of tea in Lucknow. But if they get to know about our caste, they will run into problems. A small silence follows. Then he says, To be honest, this job pays well enough to support the family. Though I don't want my children to do this work, I have accepted it as my fate. See, we used to do this work without thinking much. But now some activists and organizations, even people from my own community tell me that this is a degrading job and I should quit. But what will I do then for a living? There is no easy escape out of this job, you know. So now I do this job, but now I am uneasy. Manu looks up from chopping spinach. 7.30 is a good time to start, she tells us. Morning of day four. Sagar is driving us today at 7 a.m. We knock on the door. Bhanumati comes out without saying anything. She's wearing a yellow sari with a red border. We follow her through a maze of streets to a mound of building debris heaped on an empty plot. She takes out a bucket and a scooper hidden behind the bushes growing on top of the mound. She pours some loose debris into the bucket. She covers her head and hair with a scarf. She's visible, but she doesn't want to be and society gladly obliges. The streets have no sidewalks. Air conditioners are jutting out of houses and cars, their side view, side view mirrors folded, they're parked as close to the houses as possible. Banu's first stop is a house that we don't even have to enter. There's a hole covered with a metal sheet about three feet away from the entrance. Banu slides open the door and squats in front of the opening. She places the bucket close to the wall and using the C-shaped scooper, she drags a big lump of fresh excreta out of the hole. The cold morning has kept people indoors, but those who pass her either don't see her or they say nothing. The second house is large and is at the end of a narrow alley. Bhanu rings the bell, waits for a few seconds, and then raps on the door. Stop it! I'm coming! I'm an old woman! It takes time to get myself up and move around, you know? Panu shouts back. I know, but I also have other houses to clean. Don't you know that I come to your house around this time? An elderly woman cracks the door open. Fine, get done with your work and get out. And to us, she says, tell her not to knock so loud. The toilet is to the left of the foyer. It's a small room, one door, three partitions on the floor. The partitions create spaces, and one has to squat, balancing one's feet on the partition. Considering the amount of excreta we see, we're guessing that it's a large family. How much do these households pay? Sharda asks, as Bhanumati scoops the waste into her bucket, standing carefully on the partitions. 50 rupees, almost a dollar, per month, per person. Children who have not reached puberty and people who are over 60 years are not counted. Shata says, But they all poop, right? Panu is now washing the floor with a bucket of water and sweeping it with a broom made of coconut fronds, both set aside for this purpose. Yes, but according to the households, not so much that you pay someone to haul it away. Who can argue with them? These rules have been around for a long time. She moves very carefully in that small room, avoiding the water she is flushing into a tiny gutter that carries it out onto the street. The third house that morning has seven persons using the toilet. Panu sweeps the waste out of the hole and a lump of cloth stained with blood comes out along with the excreta. The waste from that toilet fills her bucket. Panu walks into a secluded alley behind the house the alley is covered with rectangular granite slabs. At one corner, one of the slabs is broken, and all kinds of rubbish has been crowded into the opening. Hanu uses her scooper to push the rubbish in through the hole, 
and when the litter is cleared, she throws her basket of weight, waste into the gutter. I have 30 more houses to clean today, she says, and she straightens up. Now, if we don't want this to continue, and Swachh Bharat Abhiyan clearly does not, then we have to move to the urban sanitation plan, which highlights the importance of latrine use and also of safe and proper disposal for a sanitary city. It knows that over a third of Indian households rely on on-site, which is not sewer-borne, septic tank sanitation. It recommends that cities work towards technological financing and governance initiatives that would ensure safe fecal sludge and septage management, do away with manual scavenging, while recognizing that Indian cities are currently far from this goal. These and other documents put out by the government of India actually give us very little indication of what mechanical, meaning by truck and not by hand removal, looks like. How mechanical cleaners live and work, and what therefore has to be modified or reformed. In other words, how deep is the pit that Swachh Bharat Avyan would have us climb out of? This photo essay describes an evening with septic tank cleaners and truck drivers in Bangalore, India's famed Silicon Valley. Again, we present the piece in Sharda Prasad's voice as he recalls the evening. Bengaluru, September 2014, 10.30 p.m. It has to be done only at night. The hotel does not want the neighbors or the guests to see this, Santosh says in a soft voice. It is a large, posh hotel. We service it every two months. Santosh owns a truck in which fecal sludge is removed from septic tanks and transported away to a sewage treatment plant, ideally, if the owner has a permit, or to open drains and common water bodies, commonly as most owners do not have permits. This evening, the driver is Deepak and Sharda is riding with him. Deepak is driving a yellow Tata 909, fit with a large cylindrical trunk, a tank at the back. The trunk enters a residential area and the road narrows. The gate at the end of the road is the back entrance of the hotel. The security guard opens the gate and lets the truck in. He points to a spot lit by the spilled over light from the guard's room and Deepak maneuvers the truck to back it up. Even before the truck comes to a halt, two people jump out and start uncoiling the green PVC suction hose pipe hooked to the trunk's attached tank. That short man in the green and white checkered shirt is Rajesh. The thinner person in the blue shirt is Pravi, says Deepak. All three are from the Dalit Madiga community. The location of the septic tank is dimly lit by a single incandescent bulb hanging from a braided red and yellow electric wire. We stand on top of what appears to be a concrete tank, which Deepak says is about 15 feet long and 10 feet wide. It should take about six to eight trips to empty it all out. Rajesh and Prabhu approach the tank, dragging and uncoiling the pipe with their bare hands. The flip-flops on their feet flap louder on the concrete roof of the septic tank than on the asphalt road that led to it. Rajesh opens the lid. From the look of the sludge and the strength of its smell, it's not too old. The tank is almost full. Fresh bubbles form and pop every few seconds on the surface of the turbid sludge. People pay $150 a day to stay in this hotel and their shit smells just like everybody else's. Prabhu is smirking a little bit. Rajesh connects the end of the pipe to the pump. Prabhu ties a five foot long iron bar to the end of the pipe and submerges it into the sludge. The bar acts as a mixer. Prabhu's bony arms start rotating the bar in small circles and the sludge comes to life. The water is now dark and murky. It's suspended particles. The smell grows stronger. On Prabhu's signal, Deepak starts the pump. The roaring engine of the truck starts up the vacuum pump installed between the driver's cabin and the tank. The suction makes the pipe slither for a few seconds, but the sludge soon loads into the empty pipe. The pump slurps the sludge. The level of the sludge in the septic tank drops by maybe 15 inches the tank fills up in 12 minutes. Deepak turns on the off the pump and gets into the driver's seat. Sharda sits next to Deepak. Rajesh squeezes in next to him. 
Prabhu enters. He closes the door. Deepak turns the truck towards the hotel gate. It is 11 p.m. They are out on the road without washing hands, without wearing seatbelts, with the first load of sludge. The truck goes left towards a wide four-lane road. We cross two major intersections and stop on the side of the main road at a dimly lit park. It's in front of a commercial building under construction. Blue corrugated sheets cordon off the construction area. Right where we have stopped, the gutter connected to a culvert carries water to the other side of the street. Rajesh and Prabhu quickly connect the PVC pipe to the draining end of the tank and open the valve. In eight minutes, gravity has emptied the tank. During those eight minutes, Several vehicles pass the truck, whose tank has septic tank cleaning service written on it in large, bright letters. Nobody stops to look or ask. Prabhu and Rajesh quickly roll up the pipe, hang it back on the truck. They enter the driver's cabin, again without washing their hands. Prabhu takes out a shiny packet of gutka from his pocket, shakes it vigorously, tears it open, and pours some into Rajesh's right palm. Prabhu pops the rest into his mouth and he chucks the empty pack out the window. Deepak takes out a bottle of whiskey hidden under his seat, takes a quick swig and slides it over the dashboard. The bottle snuggles between the downward slope of the dashboard and the curve of the windshield, golden liquid bouncing. Deepak starts the truck and we head back to the hotel. Now the second load is quicker because the pipe is already laid out. Within 15 minutes of arriving at the hotel, the truck is on its way to unload the second load. Deepak has been doing this work for almost a year. Rajesh for three. Prabhu has been doing this job for five years now. Hey, ask him, Deepak says. He has a lot of stories to tell you. He's a total expert in finding dumping spots. No, 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 not an expert, says Prabhu. I just get lucky, that's it. You know, um, we always on the lookout for spots to dump. The crucial part of this business is not in finding a customer to fill the tank, but finding a spot to unload it quickly. If you roam around Bangalore with a tank full of sludge, we lose money on the next customer's call. Deepak has pulled the truck to the side of the road where at the dumping site. Rajesh and Prabhu jump out and hurry to connect the pipe to unload the sludge into the gutter once more. Once this building is open, we have to find another place to dump the waste. Rajesh says, opening the drain valve. Prabhu is holding the pipe into the gutter. It can be hard to find a discrete dumping spot. I have also opened the manhole covers in the center of the city and, drum and dumped the sludge. But it has to be done very quickly though. Prabhu is coiling up the pipe. Bef before you get into the truck, go and get some chicken rice and pakoda. Deepak is calling out from the driver's seat. His hand is extended out the window, waving 100 rupees. Rajesh collects the money, quickly turns his head to either side to check for traffic, jumps over the concrete divider, runs across the other side of the road. It's now midnight. Most of the city is asleep, but the other side of the road is totally bustling. Fluorescent lamps are mounted on bamboo poles. Vendors have fluorescents dangling from the roofs of food stalls. Taxi and rickshaw drivers are getting hot food. Prabhu, Deepak and Sharda stay inside the driver's cabin because it's kind of chilly outside. Rajesh reappears. Chicken rice and pakora are wrapped in two separate banana leaf packets, nicely in a folded Kannada newspaper sheet. He passes the pakora packet to Deepak and opens the chicken rice. The aroma of hot food engulfs the driver's cabin. Nobody has washed their hands. Sharda is also starving, but at that time, he doesn't eat meat. Three men finish the rice and pakora within a few minutes. <laughs> Deepak takes a swig of whiskey. Rajesh and Prabhu share another companion with a packet of gutka. They're going to start back to the hotel now. Friends in high school and my neighbors, they got me drinking. Deepak says. Everyone I know drinks. I drink even when I don't work. Prabhu too. What about Rajesh? No, no, no. I don't drink. I just eat gutka. The hotel guard moves towards the gate as soon as he sees the truck's lights. Round three for the night. Rajesh and Prabhu work with the pipes as usual. This third trip is quick. 10 minutes to fill the tank, 12 minutes to reach the disposal site. While the sludge is draining, Rajesh and Prabhu pee into the gutter. More gutka, another golden swig. We're back at the hotel. Shada didn't go on the side of the road in public, so he needs a toilet now. 
The restaurant next to the septic tank has nice restrooms and he enters through the back door. It's 2 a.m. but the housekeeping staff, security personnel and others on the night shift are eating rice pulao and drinking tea. Three policemen are sitting together at one table. They're serving hot tea and rice pulao inside, Sharda tells Deepak, who's trying to gauge the quantity of the sludge inside the trunk. Yes, they do it every night for all the staff, Deepak responds. But they couldn't have stopped for tea there. We don't get into the dining area and eat with other people when they know that we have, we have come here to empty the septic tank. Deepak moves around the truck to turn off the pump. He knows there are policemen eating inside. The night beat policemen eat here. They don't have to pay. They never pay. The men are almost done with emptying the fourth load of sludge when a police jeep passes and stops a few meters ahead. A hand comes out of the window and beckons, and Deepak gets out and walks towards the jeep. Prabhu and Rajesh are not looking. They just continue doing whatever they were doing. In a couple of minutes, Deepak is back. Rajesh and Prabhu are coiling up the pipe. The police jeep has gone. Sharda says, What did the police say? What else? Those people want their share. I told him that we, will, we still have more trips and we get paid only after we finish all the trips. Rajesh and Prabhu get back in the truck. Deepak continues, We know each other quite well. They are on their night beat and by 5 a.m. they will be back at the police station where we have to go and pay the bride on our way back. It takes three more trips to completely empty the septic tank at the hotel. Then it is time for Sharda to say goodbye. Thank you for all your time and patience in helping me understand your work. And Deepak replies, You know, I'm 23 years old. You are the first older person from another community to call me in this formal you, Neil. I'm very happy. Shada really doesn't know what to say. He just puts his palms together and takes his leave. Quick thing, the, the second set of the photographs yeah, I should have mentioned. Yeah, weren't taken during that work because it was at night and we also wanted to keep the anonymity of the workers. So I just we showed, we showed the same record, work, yeah. but in the day. In the day. So. I mean, with Bhanu and Indu and the scavengers, they're not going to be in trouble for letting you know that they're scavengers. But the workers who clean out the waste in the hotels are not really supposed to be doing this illegally without permits, and they shouldn't be shown. So we didn't show them, and we didn't show that hotel because we don't want our work to make other people, you know, get into trouble. I'll let you take your own questions. So aren't there any formal underground sewerage even cities like in cities like Bangalore? Yeah, but only a small percentage of the city is actually sewered. And, and the last picture is about that. So this, we are not telling this story because Wherever there are sewers, they get clogged quite easily because the solid waste management in India is pathetic. So they get blocked all the time. And this is how it's usually done. Like people get into the manhole. And this is a sewer line that we are talking about, which is blocked. A person is manually emptying all the blocked plastic. So, yeah. So you think the situation is better in villages where the septic tanks don't really need this kind of regular cleaning? It's difficult to say if it's better in villages because open defecation rates are very high in villages. But in all honesty, the cleaner situation is very terrible in small towns and cities because there's a very large density of sludge and wastewater that needs to be removed. And the conditions of work are beyond terrible. And the reason we wanted to bring this up is not because, okay, it's a terrible story. That's not the point. The point is there is actually a major sanitation initiative in place right now. And it's really not, they have all these guidelines, they're excellent guidelines. But it's really not clear how the reality, the lived reality of sanitation cleaning fits into those guidelines. They're, these The people who do the work are sort of strangely absent 
they should be eliminated or abolished or septic tanks should be. Who is going to empty out the septic tanks once you convert to septic tanks? Rajesh and Deepak, that's who. So how do you have a policy in place where there is this enormous unfunded mandate at the back end, so to speak, of the cleaning? It's, it's a, a very incomplete kind of mission without a sense of the ground reality that it is supposed to intervene in. I will just, I, I really appreciate how this kind of takes the lived experience from people who are going to be doing this work, since it is necessary work, and kind of thinking about going forward and how it might change. Like, how would this like, reality, how would the circumstances change? And I wonder if you see any potential um, kind of in a more organized sense. So obviously the first two scavengers that you talk about are kind of independent contractors, but then there are the public um, sanitation workers, Gorgeous. the people who like, like yeah. as you said, um, and we do see some evidence of them going on strike or them when somebody dies making a very um, public demand. So I, I just kind of thinking about going forward, how this might change, what do you, in your work and how these people experience it. Why don't you talk a little about the Safai Karmachari Andolan? Yeah, so now in India, sanitation work can be classified into three different types, I would say. One is the manual scavenging. Like, you literally take a bucket from house to house and uh, clean dry latrines. Another one is this mechanical thing. So the mechanical part is just even we have experienced that and it varies because based on how when the septic tank was built how it was built it can easily be emptied or sometimes they have to get in and dig and loosen the sludge add water there is that and the third is as uh, sir pointed out it's about maintaining the sewerage system itself mm -hmm. so there are three different and if you see it's more about it's the same people from the same caste who are doing this mm -hmm. though the truck owner could like he's a Christian or Muslims are also owning trucks, but the actual people who sometimes do the, most of the times do the dirty job are from this caste. But things are transitioning. For example, with Safai Karmachari Andolan, they forced, uh, pushed the government to pass 2013 Prevention of Manual Scavenging Act just uh, four years ago. And because of that, now even the railways and army barracks have to think about finding other means of managing human waste. You know, they have to think, but that doesn't mean that it has to get enforced. But on the other end, when I, I was talking to these scavengers, they were like, we were, we, were, we were fine. We had just accepted it, and we have been doing it for a long time. But now all our neighbors and activists, everyone is saying that this is a degrading job. So they are kind of stuck in this transition. So till that happens, for example, they were asking, OK, fine, you're going to close these toilets. Then what will I do for my work? At least employ me in government uh, schools as sweepers. No, like, but it doesn't happen. Someone else gets that job because of political connections, and sweepers are considered superior mm -hmm. to people. They all are as considered as untouchable. So that is another fascinating part about Indian society. There is untouchability among untouchables, again, and people who touch human waste are the lowest in that mm -hmm. um, hierarchy. So, so you see the bind that they're in. I mean, I, we've seen people, they go on strike, or, they're, you know, or the Karmachari Andolan really, really energizes them and it's it's really fantastic they, they've done tremendous work uh, although maybe not quite at the scale of the problem yet but you know that's fine that takes time but do you see how they're stuck i mean even if that guy wants to do something different like start a tea store he's worried that once people know his caste and they know what they used to do nobody's going to touch that tea mm -hmm. so it's i mean the social trap is pretty severe right now unfortunately I think sometimes when you explain it that way, it almost seems like the challenge is even with, with the pilot communities, with all the other casts. And I was just curious if there are movements or strategies to change that public opinion rather than trying to stop from the bottom. Mm -hmm. So to uh, quickly answer, uh, like starting from the bottom, like the, the strategy these people are taking, uh, especially like people like they are talking about, okay, completely mechanize it. Okay, because India as a society, it, it's it's still hard for, 
large cities are providing some kind of invisibility for some of the population, so they live in one place and work in another place, and this, as you as you saw from the stories, they send their children to other schools, and they 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 are trying to play with the area that a larger city gives them. Smaller towns, you cannot do much, and villages, and that's also the other thing. Swachh Bharat Abhiyan is also about villages, and those toilets are mostly pit latrines, and they are going to fill up, and somebody has to empty them, if not today, tomorrow. So. I, I don't know with respect to the India is in this constant state of denial, right? So at one end, the way we talk about caste system in India is that, oh, it doesn't even exist. We, we, we have passed this reservation, which is more like an affirmative action. So we don't have to worry about it. And I thought so too. Just till four years ago, I always thought manual scavenging did not even exist. And this was a huge shock for me. So that's why I went there to document these things mm -hmm. for people like myself, you know? And thinking about that, I, I don't even know when 90% of the Indian marriages are still endogamous, how to get it out of this caste thinking is going to be the biggest challenge for India to move forward. But I don't have any suggestions. But. So I was just kind of curious, you, a question that I wanted to ask was about the people who end up cleaning um, this stuff, you know, I mean, using what you, that, uh, the, 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 the first, the first mm -hmm. story, right, that family versus people who are working with a truck. Could you give us a sense of how one graduates, presumably from one group that is really kind of here in the latrines to actually you know, working with trucks and pipes? So I wanted to just get a sense of how you know, mm -hmm. people, in a sense, quote unquote, graduate to cleaner work, mm -hmm. uh, relatively speaking. And, who, and how the connections get made between the people who are doing the physical cleaning and the people that you refer to as Christians and Muslims and other groups who actually own the trucks. Mm -hmm. What's the relationship mm -hmm. between those question. different groups yeah. of people? Sure. Um, yeah. And just as a kind of follow up to that, I also noticed from the pictures, and I really appreciate what you did over here in terms of just giving us a certain kind of visuality. I mean, you could have read this talk out and it just wouldn't have struck me in the same way. Um, noticing just the kind of implements and appliances, and you talked about a TV in the first family's house, um, they didn't seem to be poor of the poor, so they might be socially extraordinarily low, but they obviously have a certain amount of money that is allowing them to have what looked like a stove, you mentioned a TV, and, and there was a heater. Um, so there seem to be certain basic implements that you don't necessarily associate with scavenging communities in places like Bombay that are really extraordinarily poor. So I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit to the class issues and then how you know, the, the trucks work, who owns them, how does payment happen? Uh, not between the hotel and no, the person no. collecting, but between the people who are working. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's take the first, that question first. The, the how do the truck owners find the cleaners, I mean, what's that connection? Uh, or the trans like you're, you're also talking about yeah. how do you transform yourself mm -hmm. from... Uh, so the first thing is, once the toilets are absent, dry latrines are absent, then only this kind of job stops. So there, has, there is like a clear connection. So wherever there are trucks, it's, it's mostly because there are septic tanks which need emptying. You know, and in Lucknow, like we have had our Prime Minister Atal Bini Vajpayee come from Lucknow, today's Defense Minister is from Lucknow. Like things are changing slowly, but these are also poor households. They cannot just build a, a new toilet like this. And these houses are also very tiny for them. So for them, sanitary, like building a new toilet is a huge investment. So these, if these toilets disappear, then they have to find some other job. But like for places like Bangalore, where there was this huge explosion of construction, everybody started building septic tanks, like they're fake septic tanks, but, and then with the innovation of this truck, uh, vacuum, uh, vacuum pump based truck, they still wanted somebody to actually get into the pit, put the pipe and things like that. So all these owners, they were looking for these workers. And there was a lot of violence, especially with the people who I spoke to in, uh, Bangalore. So most of those workers, they came from Andhra Pradesh because there was lost a lot of caste-based violence mm -hmm. on Dalits, which is still a reality today. A lot of things are still happening as of now as we are speaking. So they migrated to some of the Karnataka cities because it's the neighboring state. And uh, they started moving around trying to find jobs. And it, they, they live in colonies. So you, just, you can just go to that colony and hire them. Yeah. So it, there is that kind of transition. And also, 
when there are several Dalits who decided to just let this untouchability go and get converted to Christianity or Islam or even Sikhism for that matter. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Christianity was very popular in some of the regions in India because of untouchability. But the society already knows where they come from. So they are now classified as Christian Dalits, Muslim Dalits, Sikh Dalits. So they have their own church and mosque and Gurdwara. So I'm not saying that it's like that everywhere, but even that is another one now. You're like, you're, you, you neither have any quota, you're still treated as an untouchable. So that's another difficult position. But the ownership part, again, is another which uh, Isha was also pointing out. The policy is talking about mechanization. But these people, they don't have access to finance. You know, they're so scared of even opening a tea stall. They're like, we don't know how to handle money, which I totally understand. I don't know how many of us will be comfortable just starting a business and not worried about. So they have no idea. So the truck owners, they all have access to capital. They come <coughs> from like middle class or upper middle class. They're, they're very good with their money. So there is also that which the policy doesn't even talk about. And as Isha pointed out, these are completely invisible. Like what, what happens to these people? Is there anybody who would employ them or whatever? So there is that aspect. And again, when it comes to truck operation, there are like three different ownership, management, actual work. So ownership could be anybody. Management is the driver who drives, is usually the manager. He takes the calls, he makes sure that it is empty and whatnot. And then the actual sanitation work is usually these two additional people who do the work. And sometimes it gets mixed too, based on the type of the job. Sometimes it's very clean. You just open a lid, you put the pipe, it's done. So there is a, yeah, all these things. And they get paid, for example, per trip about $30 is the entering fee. Per, it's like per uh, truckload. Okay? And sometimes some septic tanks, they take two truckloads, 50 to $60. But these workers, they paid about, maybe I would say $150 a month. Okay? Which, coming back to the manual scavengers part where you were asking, they had a television. A used television doesn't cost much in India. And these houses are, like this house yeah, I wanted is to like, show this picture. Yeah, like, that is, there is just an entrance to that house. And that is that, is that house. That there is nothing else in that house. But look how beautifully it's kept. It's like sparkling clean. Yeah. Really, we I, we wanted to show this picture because it's they don't they do that kind of work, but if you look at their houses, it feels to me like they have the same aspirations, the same lifestyle, the same personal sense of hygiene as anybody. It's just that they have to do this work, and then they're treated like animals when they do the work. But if you look at this woman's house, it looks beautiful, right? It's really clean, it's really nicely kept, it's really nicely organized. She has aspirations for her children. They've got backpacks and they go to this Christian school so nobody can tell that they're Dalit children. You know, it's kind of more heartbreaking actually when you juxtapose the life of work they have and the life to which they so desperately aspire. And uh, like some of them, as a, uh, they, they want to go to private schools so that they get better education. Like free government schools, there are no teachers in most of the schools in, in these places. And this particular kid, he wants to become a bike mechanic. And like, they, are, they have all these nice aspirations. He's 11 years old, but he's already going and servicing certain motorcycles. Like when you say bike mechanics, it's in India. It's like a, he's a motorcycle mechanic already. And he's the only guy who does this job for now. But there are also these stories about how women get trapped into this work. For example, they lie, the families lie to one another, and when the, once the woman gets married to this family, the mother-in-law is like, okay, tomorrow we'll go and clean toilets. And Dr. Mulder goes, what? Yeah, otherwise you won't get any food. She cannot divorce and go somewhere else. And some of these stories were really horrifying to hear that they just did not know. And she wouldn't be served any food otherwise. So now she has to, because mother-in-law, she inherits mm -hmm. these That's houses. What yeah. was telling us. Yeah. So, she, the, so the daughters-in-law, they have to do this now. And it's a currency of exchange. Now things are changing. Houses are slowly disappearing and the new toilets are coming. But there is also that other aspect where you, we are talking about the transition from manual scavenger. But several women, they didn't do this job. Their family came from a different, they were just peasants and they get married off to these places in the city. And city, being the invisible place it could be, sometimes can easily trap women. And yeah, some of the stories are really horrifying. You know? 
I have two questions. Um, one is, um, image of the hotel where you know people are paying $150 and so what I want to know is how I mean how pervasive is this like how many septic tanks are there I mean if I go to a Taj Palace hotel in Delhi is there a septic tank in the yeah. background like how does it work I mean is there a drainage system like Shakti Da was saying how far do the pipes go what percentage of a city is covered by pipes and then um, In Delhi, what is it, like 25 to 30 percent, I may be forgetting the number exactly, but that's the amount of wastewater generated that the wastewater treatment plants have the capacity to, to treat. So capacity means they may not be running at full capacity, of course, but if everything is running great, then maybe 20. But that's, you know, a third, right? And a l very large number of very... Um, uh, upper class establishments, what they typically do is they kind of opt out of the public infrastructure system. So they have their own RO plant, mm -hmm. so they're not bothered about the city supply, right? They have their own, um, you know, internal flushing mechanism. So if you flush at like the, you know, Taj Man Singh or something like that in Delhi, you will think that this is a normal flush. But actually, I don't know about the Man Singh particularly, but something like, you know, the hotel we were at was. In fact, a Taj, right? It was a Taj, right? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it was a Taj, right? It was a Taj. So you know, very luxurious. So you, as a customer, you can't see that maybe it's going into this enormous septic tank, and then every month or every two months, it's being cleaned up like this. So it's very, it's much more. Frankly, it's much more efficient for the hotel to do it that way than to try to leverage the city's public infrastructure, which may or may not reach there, may or may not. As far as possible, they try to opt out and they internally privatize as much as possible. But what happens, other conditions are like this. And that's where I'm, we're trying to say, you know, both of us, I mean, we've read the government's new fecal sludge and septage management policy. It's a great document, right? It's pretty practical in many ways, but, it's when you see this that you realize, you know, how far one has to go to actually achieve Swatch Bharat's um, goals and targets. How far you have to go. You know, how, how further back the situation is relative to what the policy documents, you know, really kind of account for. And, and I always come back to you know, how little, how, how small the resources are that are actually put aside within Swatch Parat, which is, you know, a pretty I impressive investment program. How much of it is going into building toilets, which is what I would always call the front end of the sanitation system, and how little is put into education, awareness, information, you know, breaking off taboos, rehabilitating scavengers, how little actually goes into that, which is actually the back end of the system. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I'm sorry, I can I ask a second question, I remember. Now, these are sort of cities which are being, you know, like Gurgaon or, mm -hmm. you know, large, I'm sure Bangalore too, and, you know, large sections of this. These are all planned cities. At least is how I sort of read about it. Now, is there, there's, you know, there's the municipal, Corporation, there's a PWD, there's all these, you know, fancy, you know, sort of acronyms of organ government organizations that are meant to kind of sort of, you know, maintain a city. So all these karamcharis, the Safai Andolan karamcharis and all, are they part of the government? Is there a sanitation department? Do they yeah. hire them? Are they paid a salary? I mean, how does that work then? I mean, there must be something like that. Uh, yeah, there are, of course there are. It, most of them are not employed in a government job with benefits, but the government does employ in a government job with benefits. But one of the things to bear in mind is that, you know, um, even today, although manual scavenging has been abolished, 
Um, one of the largest employers of manual scavengers in effect is in fact the Indian railway system mm -hmm. because railway tracks are a popular morning uh, shitty place basically um, early in the morning mm -hmm. off the sides of the railway tracks or right onto the tracks themselves and they have to be removed. And so the, legally, if you have protective gear, proper kinds of shoes, and aprons, and gloves, and hats, you're not a manual scavenger. Legally, you're a sweeper who is not a manual scavenger. But I personally have never seen that kind of outfitted individual cleaning the toilets or cleaning the railway tracks. They, they look like completely unprotected people in a khaki uniform and flip-flops. So technically speaking, they are still manual scavengers, even though they're employed by the government, the Indian Railways, and have benefits. And just to add to that, for example, in Mumbai, Mumbai, at one end, yes, we are seeing this, but on the other end, the last picture that I showed, it's in Chennai, you know, yeah. that sewer line. But they have to get in and do all this job, and all these uh, Dalits, they are from the Balmiki community or Madiga mm -hmm. community, they have different caste names in different states, uh, but they all belong to the lowest. So, they actually, many of their husbands die because of alcoholism. Because of, and when they are drunk, they cannot really judge and they end up doing mistakes like dropping a crowbar on their feet or getting into a manhole which has a lot of poisonous gases. So, they all are widow and but these widows, they in turn become scavengers because this government job gives you a small coaling. It gives you a small place in Mumbai because the Mumbai uh, Municipal Council has to give you housing. So they end up, be and then these widows, they get harassed in a very different way. You know, like lowest caste is one thing. So there is that aspect to that. And coming back to the planning part, as Isha was pointing out, it's also about planning in India gets approved only if you pay bribe. It's not because it's a properly planned well. document. So there is also that aspect to it. And then the police, <coughs> who was there while we were dumping, I was so scared. The whiskey bottle was on the dashboard. I was like, oh my God, this is awful. I don't know what my parents are going to think. I had like all, but nothing happened. You know, these people are still pumping the sludge away. They are not even budging. And this guy, and that is, see, I had heard these stories, you know, and then when you see them, that's a different, I don't know, you become a different type of cynic. <laughs> so, so there is also that with respect to India and uh, the document is very ambitious, it's beautiful. The way it talks about, oh, but who pays them to build these new septic tanks? They cost two lakh rupees, you know, which is more like $4,000, while these pits, they just cost you $300. Who, who will go for what? We have to think about that, you know? So, yeah. so continuing on that line, I mean, a big story is like the caste system, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Most of us, middle classes, upper classes, we are not aware of, you know, what's going on. Like this is, you know, the lowest of the lowest of the untouchables. So, when we talk about the government or the railways, these are also people. Yes. And they are like, say, let's say, the middle classes and that are running this. A part of this is like when they write these policies, they're not even aware, or they don't care, or whatever you want to call it, when I mean, they write these policies or push these initiatives. Yeah. Have you shown you know, your photo essay or present day, uh, like presented your results and photos to this audience of either government officials or railways, but also in general just middle and upper classes that you know, and what, are, what were their reactions or do you plan to do well, we just We just put this together, but if part right. of the reason we were very keen to put this together is because, you know, eventually there'll be like academic papers and whatnot out of the work that Shadda's doing and all that stuff, the standard stuff that Berkeley does. But I think that this aspect of it is, you know, so fundamental to whatever it is that we do in, in the sanitation world that unless we find a way to make it, um, very clear and very blunt. So when we wrote this up, we didn't want to use any euphemisms. We didn't want, you know, we should know what that experience is because that's the only way you, 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 you know, what is it that I have to reform, right? What is the thing that needs a reform, right? It's, it's very difficult to get that across because it's a very, um, it's a very disgusting topic. It's an embarrassing topic. It's a disgusting topic. 
we would most of us rather not see. Really, really, I think that's true. So, you know, we would love to solicit ideas from this group since you sat through our photo essay. Say, where is the best place to, you know, highlight, I don't want to say the plight or condition of these workers, we want to say, you know, this is the lived experience of the working conditions of people, this is the ground reality of the system that the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan is trying to reform. Look where we are and look where we want to be. But how can you say where you want to be until you know where we are? And we are really very open to, I mean, we think we should do this through the narrative form and photographs as opposed to data tables and things like that. Um, and we're not really 100% sure where would be the most effective and where people would look as opposed to, you know, get up and leave after the first five slides which is what people feel like doing, actually. And I don't blame them. That's what they feel like doing. So, I don't know. I, I, I think I would, I mean, we would both really appreciate whatever I did. We thought of some venues, but we're not sure whether, because if you keep going to the kind of social science type of semi-academic venues, then that's not the people you need to reach. I can't imagine someone now in Lucknow or the Kolkata Municipal Corporation inviting Sharda Nien to give this talk. I kind of really can't imagine it. And it's very, very ingrained. There are homes in North India particularly where there's a separate small door through which nobody walks in or out and the guy comes in or the woman comes in just to clean the toilet. There's a special door for her. It's, it's, the separation is really deep. You know, composted human waste. Ask Sharda what it's called in Karnataka. So they call it as Bhangi Gobar. Bhangi Gobar. Bhangi, like Bhangi is the Bhangi name is of the caste. caste. Mm -hmm. And they call that compost as Bhangi Gobra because Bhangi is the guy who actually carries this waste. And this is such a dangerous thing because especially when you are talking to the community, some people were very upset with me because I'm talking to some of the bhangis, which I wouldn't know, you know, because I would just use this word. And the, the, I completely agree with you, Ranjit. When it comes to ca caste, India really needs to rethink and be honest with itself. And also all the people who are in these, like the bureaucrats, they are not only middle class, they are from upper caste. Like, how many Dalits can you find in, like Mayavati, of course, she was the chief minister, but that's a different story. Yeah. Uh, like, even Dalits are not helping Dalits. That's another, they're just treating them as vote banks. So uh, it's, it's really, really, really hard. And it's not that this work hasn't been done. There have been so many activists who have taken pictures. Yeah. And yeah. So it has happened, including in Mumbai, Sudhara Kalvi took such amazing pictures. He's even published a book. And Tata is like, oh, we will fund you to publish this book. And it just stopped there. Nothing else happened. Mm -hmm. So and yeah, and that's where I mean we need to brainstorm. Yeah, I we really otherwise do. it always just feels like oh my god, like I really feel it right. now. Now what? Now? Right now what? And and uh, what if Tata did fund the book? Whose coffee table is that book going to adorn? Yeah. Whose yeah. coffee table? If you got a choice between various shots of the Taj Mahal, mm -hmm. right, and then various shots of shit pots, you tell me, what coffee table is going to choose the second? We have to brainstorm a little as a community about like, how do you really make this count. I'm curious, is this a conversation about caste or is it about sanitation? Both. Mm -hmm. So because, I mean, sanitation, I think in caste and removing caste is going to be... Not removing caste, but you can't address the sanitation cleaning problem, the back end problem as I call it. Right. Without addressing the cost but issue, if we can cannot if, be done. If we can, you know, if we can brainstorm about, you know, not publishing a book or yeah. anything, but about solutions, how to kind of, I mean, this job has to be done. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I think the job will remain. Is there a way of finding a cleaner way of doing yeah. it? Yeah. And uh, you know, and I, I, I feel maybe if you know the community can become richer, maybe at you know, I don't know. This could just be a hope or whatever, but. You know, as people get economically better off, I think, you know, I have seen how caste kind of also doesn't matter that much. No, no, we are not going to say that, oh, this is just cannot, nothing, there's no movement. I mean, we wouldn't be here with that attitude, but that is a long way to go. I feel like if the SBA has to succeed, 
we really have to own the fact that there's a really long way to go. I mean, that is just the reality, just as we can see. Did Greece have a question? Yeah. Should we go to Greece? Oh, you should have a question. Well, we both have questions. Okay. With the brainstorming sort of launching or invitation you just uh, made, I wonder if you could look, I mean, I see top-down solutions and bottom-up solutions, and the CAS is very much more of a bottom-up solution. And I think with the top-down solution, it's an informal and formal problem. Um, and I wonder if when you try looking at formal solutions, if you could look at non, sort of non-Indian investors, like when you when you say front end and back end, the first mm -hmm. thing that comes to my mind is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. Who is funding the toilets if, like outside of India? Right. Can we influence the, mm. those participants by swaying? Because they're sort of extra cast. They're not thinking in, in yeah. that light. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe like uh, quote unquote objective information could, yeah. could make more of a difference uh, with, mm. that, with that audience. Mm, um, and I'm not, I'm not sure, maybe I'm, I'm just associating Bill and Melinda with toilet incorrectly. Mm -hmm. No, no, yeah, I think not incorrectly, but um, I'm, I'm sure they're not seeing this side of it. Yeah. They're working more on technologies that would kind of do away with any sort of person cleaning it, and I think that eventually that may be the best way to go, but we could be looking at several decades. Several decades. Before that kind of you know, totally self-cleaning type of toilet, yeah. which doesn't need any kind of manual intervention, becomes the no. It could be some time before that happens, right? But do you think that some of these foundations are more interested in technology solutions as opposed to from more of a public health perspective? I for suspect both public so. health as well as worker health. Yeah. 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 And I think that's fine. That's totally fine to do that. The, 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 the social problem of these people's livelihood, social standing, caste occupation, etc., still remains. You know, the, the thing that Charles was pointing to is if we do away with their livelihoods, then it has to be something in its place. You know? And and that's why this is a very why this is simultaneously a caste problem and a sanitation problem. And it's very artificial to separate the two from what we've seen. And uh, to answer both of your questions, to add to that is is about who is doing that kind of a job in developed like, nations, high income nations, right? So even there, it's quite fascinating to see that the way these people get classified. There was a very beautiful anthropological study about just trash, uh, uh, like solid waste management in New York, like the kind of people who do that, and people don't even notice them. They are invisible, and their dating life is a different story altogether. Who they can date, who they can marry, and things like that. And that's also fascinating because we all think that, oh, this society, not, not really, we are not very different. That's another thing which I want to talk about. And also all the solutions that we are all talking about, they are really expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, like thinking about treatment and transportation and whatnot. Like mm -hmm. just imagine the kind of money that you have to pay uh, back in India. It's a very, like it has to be incentivized in a different way. So, uh, sewer networks. Nobody really pays for the infrastructure, like World Bank pays for the uh, construction of the sewer, and we pay like $200 to get connected on a monthly basis, maybe $20, but here, I have to start with $4,000. And I have to start with like... Uh, if you build your own yeah, septic yeah, tank. If I build a proper septic tank and whatnot. Like, how are you, when we suggest these good solutions, they all are expensive, and as a low-income country, well, like where, where, where is that going to come from? Where that money is going to come from? And even for that matter, just to give you a quick information, Paris has one of the oldest sewer infrastructures, right? There, the workers are asked to retire 10 years early, even though they wear all the safety gear and whatnot and get into the underground city, which reflects the exact street pattern, they are asked to get, retire 10 years early because their life expectancy reduces even after wearing all the safety gear. So how many of us, so sometimes my, my major challenge is that if not solve this problem, how do you even make them visible to all of us? How do we, how many of us make eye contact with our own janitors or, you know, trash? I, I don't know. There's also that problem with this society too when it comes to sanitation work, but it may not be as stigmatized exactly. as mm -hmm. it is in India. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Can you connect this work to your dissertation, please, for us? I mean, 
you're working on waste management, you're thinking about cultural attitudes in farming, and the, the ways by which one can move certain kinds of excreta to productive uses, right? Yeah. And I was just wondering, is there some way to link this particular story that you've told us to the, the dissertation that we all anticipating in December? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in November, I guess. <laughs> so the thing is this, right? So uh, I was interested in how is human waste collected in India? So the reason why I was studying about, okay, what are the different means that are available and how are they managing it? And that's how I got introduced to this. And then I have to think about if it has to be reused as fertilizer, it needs to be composted or treated in one place. Like what kind of mechanisms exist to transport? Like here, it just gets thrown away in some gutter or outside the town and things like that. So in my case, I'm talking about the risks of uh, uh, sanitation workers. So I'm working on a paper uh, trying to quantify risks. So it, some of these practices will, these observations will feed into that, but when it comes to reusing human waste as fertilizer, caste comes again into that because farm owners, they want to use uh, fecal sludge, but farm workers, they don't want to touch it because the moment they touch it, they are relegated to LOR caste. So they are like, no, we are not going to do it. But the farm owner knows that it's really good fertilizer. So sometimes he cheats his workers by mixing it with cow manure, where everything that comes from cow is very holy in India. So they cheat. there is the another interesting aspect of how caste plays out when it comes to reusing uh, human waste. And it is not getting treated, but many farm owners are using it. So there is also that aspect. Ah, it's, uh, but yeah, that's where, again, the caste intersection is very important in India. Without caste, I don't know. Uh, We're thinking of using these observations in Shahada's work as a kind of building up of a supply chain. There is a supply chain of fecal sludge for reuse. Okay, it's not a very safe supply chain. It's not a very healthy supply chain, but there is a supply chain. And the, these things are part of Bangalore's vibrant economy. You know, so I, I think, you know, Shada's hoping to, to make these aspects of Bangalore's business economies more visible. Like that's the sort of underground economy on which, you know, these peripheral gardens and whatnot basically depend. They do. But who wants to know? That's our job. We're going to try. That's all I can say. <laughs> okay. On that note, thank you, thank you so much, Isha. Thank you, Sarada. Thank you.